respecting the world rules and adapting the gameplay so it feels good and fun. I don't know if that spurs any other thoughts, but... Well, can I, add, can I ask a specific, maybe, thing that relates to that? Which is, it was... Yep. Uh, Derek, it's really interesting to hear you talk about chaos versus order and this idea of just um, adding things and maybe not worrying so much about elegance. But I also wonder, maybe it's not just a simple chaos versus order, but, but where the order is happening or not. And the thing I always come back to is Spelunky that blows my mind is I think this even is like a programming thing that like everything is using the same underlying logic, right? Like the fact that the ghost had 99 health rather than like special cased in code, then let the, I'll call these like unexpected exploits happen when like, you know, Benazorus kills the ghosts or, or whatever. And it like, uh, you know, whether that was you or Andy or both of you, there does seem like some ordered, I don't know, I don't know if that's even the right word, but design programming decision um, that la allows all of the things in the system to interact, which is where you then get the magic of Spelunky. Uh, you know, with the boomerang guy stealing, like, walking into the black market and stealing the boomerang is another, like, great example of that. So is that, like, do you, is it fair to call that a certain type of elegance or order that then underpins the chaos? Or what, what yeah, what's your feeling on that, the, like, to me, that's the, the secret strength of Spelunky, that glue that holds it all together. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there does sort of have to be that, that underlying order. I mean, you can get a lot of, and maybe the best inspiration just comes from real life and kind of how you see real life as being as being built, you know, and real life is feels very chaotic, but there is an underlying order, I think, at the very smallest depths, and yeah, so I, with Spelunky, I just feel like it's, it's much more interesting to have that order sort of at that level versus at the, the higher level of you know what what you're able to do or is this is this item balanced and things like that um so yeah I, i'm still kind of playing with this idea of, of order versus chaos which is why i i was excited to, to bring it to you to you guys um but ultimately i just feel like there are a lot of these ideas in game design that are kind of accepted Right, that I even with Splunky One, I was starting to question like, does a game sort of need to start off easy and then just linearly get get harder as it goes? And I, by the time I was done with Splunky One, I felt like that was definitely not always true. Yep. That that is the best experience for the player. It sounds like that's what you're games themselves are so complicated and made from all these different little parts that it just some. You know, a statement like that, that just, it just, that just seems way too, way too bold to make. Good design know? statement that you just said is the, um, <clears throat> the, my new Derek U quote is going to be definitely not always true. <laughs> <laughs> that's because it's, that's just yeah. like every time you try to teach any form of design thinking and skill and like in code, whatever it is we've figured out. It's always very important to note that you're, that this may not always apply right? because of because right. of the, the flexibility that one needs to have in a design a design task. Yeah. Well, you know, there's this kind of general idea when you're learning any kind of craft or anything that you know you first you learn all the rules and then you learn how to break them or when you can break them. And I think that's, it's kind of true of playing games too, right? Like that's when people play games, they learn the rules and then they, they figure out how they can break them and exploit them. And it's kind of interesting during the development of Spelunky 2, I'll, I'll notice just kind of interacting back and forth with Blit on things. Um, you know, there'll be occasions where, where like Mickey will come to me and say, you know, the the testers at Flit who've been playing the game, they like found some exploit, right? Where they can just really easily do this. 
and it just, I don't know, if there's a boss, they can just instantly kill the boss this way, and it, and it just, it feels way too easy, or, right, like, it just, it feels like it, it that you shouldn't be able to do that, and um, a lot of times, I'm, like, really excited that you can do that. <laughs> like, that's exactly what I want people to be able to do in Spelunky, and I want them to have that feeling all the time. Maybe not all the time, actually. I want them to have that feeling enough times of, like, whoa, I I don't feel like I should have been able to do that at all. Yeah. But I did it, you know? This is the thing I, that... Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just... I think, like, on those lines... I, man, Andy and I are sitting right next to each other, and we can't even not interrupt each other. <laughs> uh, General problems. <laughs> Uh, I, I think just on that line, I mean, this this is this must be your first. Um, is this your first experience working with like a proper QA team, and then also like just having a QA team on a on a roguelike style game? I mean, I can't even. How many roguelike games in history have had proper QA teams? It's, it's so so irregular. Are there any? Um, any other sort of like strange interactions or, or I mean what's what's that like working on this game um, with a team like that it's great I mean most of my interaction is with Mickey um Mickey I call I, I just call Mickey all the time his, his full name is Miguel Pasquale but I call him Mickey and so he's kind of like the lead on Blitz side and so most of my interaction is, is with him and I think for the most part, it feels just like working with Andy or with Alec, where it's just very casual and, and easygoing and, and fun. But yeah, every now and then, Mickey will mention, especially getting builds ready for packs and things like that. It'll be like, okay, you know, it'd be good if we had like a week of testing before we, we lock down the build so we should have this done by this time is something that you know Mickey will say to me and that's new for sure <laughs> and I think it's uh deadlines deadlines <laughs> yeah and uh and it's good because I think the the builds have held up really well and it's actually a pretty funny contrast with the UFO 50 which I'm also working on which is just you know with a bunch of indie developer friends and we're making it in game maker and there's no QA to speak of and we're working on builds the night before shows and things like that so but yeah I don't know I I think generally it, it, it feels very much like any other development but every now and then yeah Mickey will talk about QA and testers and things like that and, and kind of yeah, I, I realize that I'm working with a larger, more professional team. Is there anything through that testing or even through seeing people play the game at events that was like a big surprise to you that you've seen so far as it's been shown a few times now? Not really. I wouldn't say I've been... No, I, I wouldn't really say I've been surprised. Okay. They'll, they'll find a way. To find I, would say, um, I would say that the... The boss at the, the at the end of the first area, um, yeah. I, actually, that that part I would say was was interesting to watch because I wasn't sure exactly how people would approach that, and people tended to, I think, approach it in in a much more just chaotic fashion than I was than I was planning, um, which is interesting. You know, we're talking about order and chaos and all that but since it's people's first time fighting that boss and they have no idea how it's supposed to how it's quote unquote you know meant to play out at all um yeah i've noticed that it's it's just much more chaotic than and there's just a lot more uh yeah i know it's it's crazier than i was expecting but it's also great because i you know i i can see that they do get through the fight and it, it it definitely they have lots of emotions as they're going through it and all that. Well even, even the context of it I think is is interesting because it you sort of don't know if it is a boss or a mini boss or just like a big enemy like because the first game doesn't really have bosses outside of the final bosses I think maybe that's 
where part of that comes from is people aren't sort of sure how seriously they should take it or if they should, uh, you know, they should treat it like a boss fight in another video game. Or at least that's some of the feelings that I've heard. Right. Which I think is great, and that's exactly what, what I want. And yeah. Yeah. definitely felt and, like and, and in Spelunky, there are, there are usually ways that I'm kind of thinking well, you could approach this obstacle in this way. So there's, I think that the thing is, is that I'm leaving, I'm trying to leave open all of these other possibilities that will still work on top of that. And and I like the fact that in a lot of ways, I don't like bosses as a concept because a lot of times that means that they're just so different and, and walled off from the rest of the game that they exist in and I don't like that at all um, I like kind of the emotional impact of bosses in video games of like okay I fought a bunch of like smaller enemies and now here's a really big strong one and they've got their own their own room that they inhabit that that feels cool to me what I but what I don't like is uh, the fact that yeah mechanically they're usually just completely separated also and they've got their own unique way that you've got to approach them and you know you have to hit them at least a hundred times to defeat them and I, like actually that. on that line um i really i've always been really impressed by the design